Okay, so let's continue our discussion. Our next dis distinction will be between a contract of sale and a contract to sell. So a contract to sell is defined as a bilateral contract whereby the prospective seller, while expressly res reserving the ownership of the subject property, despite its delivery to the prospective buyer, commits to sell the property exclusively to the prospective buyer upon full payment of the purchase price. So illustrative case is the Spouses Beltran versus Spouses Kangaida case. So some basic distinctions between the two contracts. In a sale, the title passes to the buyer upon delivery. However, in a contract to sell, there is delivery, but ownership is still reserved to the prospective seller. In a sale, the effect of non-payment of the price is a negative, uh, the non-payment of the price is a negative resolutory condition. While in a contract to sell, uh, full payment is a positive suspensive condition. The failure of which is not a breach, but prevents the obligation of the vendor to convey title from having binding force. The remedies between the two contracts, if there is a breach, is different. In a sale, the remedies are either specific performance or rescission. But in a contract to sell, the prospective seller here is granted the right to extrajudicially rescind the contract. So what happened in the case of Spouses Beltran versus Spouses Kangaida? Kangaida. So the prospective seller here are the spouses Kangaida and the prospective buyer is the, are the spouses Beltran. So they entered into an oral sale of land. Spouses Kangaida verbally agreed to sell their lot to spouses Beltran for 35,000 pesos. So the buyers here were able to make an initial payment. And they took possession of the property and was able to build a family home in the lot. Uh, they were able to make additional payments and collectively they had already paid 29,690 pesos. But there was still a remaining balance, which the spouses Beltran were unable to pay. So they entered into an amicable settlement in the barangay. However, the spouses Beltran still failed to pay. So the spouses Kangaida filed a complaint for recovery of possession and damages against the spouses Beltran. Okay, and the regional trial court ruled in that complaint uh, that there was merely a contract to sell between the parties uh, based on the uh, based largely on the fact that in the amicable settlement reach at the barangay, the spouses Kangaida uh, agreed that they will enter or execute a deed of sale upon settlement of the balance. So this to the regional trial court indicated that there was only a contract to sell and not an absolute sale of the uh, lot. So Court of Appeals affirmed the ruling of the regional trial court and that decision was still appealed and when it reached the Supreme Court, the court, the highest court of the land here, uh, reversed the two lower courts and they held that there was already an absolute sale of the properties and not merely a contract to sell. So how did the Supreme Court reach this conclusion that there was already an absolute sale of the properties. So the Supreme Court held that uh, Supreme Court held that uh, contract of sale is perfected by mere meeting of the minds, correct? And considering that there was already delivery of the property, then uh, that already transferred ownership to the buyers, the spouses Beltran. And the fact that the 
contract of sale was only oral uh, did not negate the fact that there was perfection already of the contract. Okay, and the stipulation, the agreement in the amicable settlement at the barangay that the spouses kangaida will execute a deed of a formal deed of sale does not uh, affect the perfection of the oral contract of sale between the parties. So the Supreme Court held that clause six of the amicable settlement merely states uh, the buyer's commitment, uh, the seller's commitment to formalize and reduce the oral agreement of the parties into a public instrument upon payment of the outstanding balance. So it bears emphasis that a formal document is not necessary for the sale transaction to acquire binding effect. Okay, so uh, what we learned from that case, guys, is that uh, in order for a contract to sell uh, to be uh, enforceable against the prospective buyer, there must be a formal instrument. Why? Because there must be express reservation of ownership despite delivery of the property. So if there's no express reservation, you know, oral lang sales sa parties, then of course, the rule in the civil code that upon delivery, there is already transfer of ownership. Uh, that will be uh, what will govern the relations of the parties. So na absolute sale that transpired. Because how else can you prove reservation of ownership except for, ex unless you execute a formal written document, a deed of sale, and naka indicate to dito clearly that there was reservation of ownership. So another important distinction is that between a contract to sell and a conditional sale. So I assigned two cases for this, the Ventura versus Heirs of Indaya and Spouses Roque versus Aguado. So important distinction between the two. In a contract to sell, we need to know what is the effect of fulfillment of the conditions because both of these contracts are in the nature of conditional sales. So as to effect of fulfillment of condition, in a contract to sell, there's no automatic transfer of ownership to the buyer, although there was previous delivery. So there is still a need for the uh, prospective seller and prospective buyer to execute a deed of sale upon fulfillment of the condition. Well, in a conditional sale, the once the condition is fulfilled or once it happens, it will render the sale absolute and the previous delivery of the property has the effect of automatically transferring the seller's ownership or title to the buyer. There's no more need to execute a separate deed of sale. With regards to what will happen in these two contracts when the condition is not fulfilled. So take note that the usual condition ani na mga conditional sales guys will be the full payment of the purchase price. So what if there is a failure to pay in full the purchase price? Then in a contract to sell, the obligation to transfer ownership will not arise at all. Okay, what money happen ang condition? In a conditional sale, the sale is considered as rescinded and the ownership will revest in the seller. So what happens with these two contracts if there is alienation or mortgage of the property by the seller before the fulfillment of the condition? So in a contract to sell, those alienation or mortgage will be considered as valid because the seller here is still the owner of the property. Kaya nag-reserve man siya sa ownership, di ba? Despite delivery. But in a conditional sale, 
the subsequent alienation to another buyer or the mortgage of the property uh, by the seller before the fulfillment of the condition, that those subsequent uh, transfers or mortgage is considered as void because the, the seller here is not anymore considered the owner. Okay. Uh, pending the happening of the condition, the uh, owner is not the seller is considered to have parted with this ownership already. Marivestra ang ownership to the seller in a conditional sale if the condition was not fulfilled. So did they shapede mo alienate or mortgage while the condition has not yet been fulfilled or it's or, or if it's deter if it, if it has been determined that it's impossible to fulfill that condition. And another distinction between these two contracts is the applicability of the rule on double sales. So in a contract to sell, double sales is not applicable. But in a conditional sale, the rule on double sales is applicable. So in the case of Ventura versus Ears of Spouses and Daya, the, we learn here that a contract to sell is akin to a conditional sale because the obligatory force of the obligation on the part of the vendor to transfer title is subordinated or conditioned upon the happening of a future and uncertain event. So that if the suspensive condition does not take place, the parties would stand as if the conditional obligation had never existed. So despite, uh, despite these similarities of the contract to sell and, the, uh, and a conditional sale, take note of those important differences, huh? the one that was previously shown, it's a slide. On the other hand, in, this, in the case of spouses Roque versus Aguado, uh, we learn here the effect of uh, the applicability of the rule on double sales. So what happened here was that there was a contract to sell between the parties. And the seller here was able to, uh, decided to sell the property to another. So uh, despite the second sale to, the, to another buyer, the first uh, buyer was able to fulfill the condition, which is payment of the full payment of the purchase price. So they wanted to, uh, give effect to the contract to sell. They wanted the seller to execute a deed of sale in their favor already. So the harsh reality of the inapplicability of double sales can be seen in this case because it was held here that uh, in a contract to sell, since the agreement between the prospective seller and prospective buyer includes express reservation of ownership, then a third person buying such property, despite the fulfillment of the suspensive condition in the contract to sell, uh, cannot, uh, cannot make that third buyer, uh, that third person, a buyer in bad faith. Okay, and the prospective seller here cannot seek reconveyance anymore of the property. Okay, the second buyer is not considered in bad faith, man. Uh, there is no double sale in such case. So title to the property will transfer to the buyer after registration because there is no defect in the owner-seller's title per se. So the only remedy of the prospective buyer as against the prospective seller in that contract to sell is damages. Di na niya makuha ang property. So, pait na. 
Another important distinction is that between conditional sale and absolute sale. So pretty straightforward niya guys. Uh, conditional sale, then of course, there are conditions imposed on the obligation to transfer ownership. Well, in absolute sale, there is no such reservation. And as to power to rescind, guys, the vendor has the unilateral power to rescind the contract predicated on the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of the prescribed condition if there is conditional sale. While in an absolute sale, there is no unilateral right to rescind because we know already that in the contract of sale is a bilateral and reciprocal contract. So there is only delay when one party is willing, ready, and able to, to fulfill its obligation, an obligation, but the other party is not. So there's no unilateral right to rescind. So favorite topic is just a bar, guys. Cunning distinctions between conditional sale and absolute sale contract to sell and contract of sale. So it's important for you to learn these uh, concepts. Okay, so that's the important ruling in Ventura versus ears of spouses in Daya. Okay, 2012 bar. Also ask, would you agree that the contract to sell is the same as a conditional contract of sale. So that's how you answer. Although it is akin to a contract to a conditional sale, it's very different, the contract to sell. Okay, another important distinction is that between pacto de retro sales versus equitable mortgage versus pactum commissorium. So why do I want you to distinguish this between these uh, three concepts? So the illustrative case here is the case of Ramos versus Sarau. So what happened in this case? So Ramos here, is the seller while Sarau is the buyer. So they entered into a deed of sale under Pacto de Retro. So what do you understand by Pacto de Retro? So this is a kind of sale wherein there is a right to repurchase by the seller in a given period of time. So in the case of Ramos and Sarau, uh, Ramos, the Ramos spouses had the option to repurchase the property within six months from the execution of their deed of sale. And the, the parties here also agreed that should the spouses Ramos fail to pay the monthly interest or exercise the right to repurchase within the stipulated period, the conveyance will, will already be deemed as a deed of absolute sale. So Ramos here failed to uh, report, exercise the right to repurchase. So what Susana Sarau did was she filed a complaint to consolidate her ownership in a pacto de retro sale. On the other hand, the spouses Ramos also filed a case to compel the repurchase to exercise their the right to repurchase. Okay, na sila argument with respect to the full payment or the uh, repurchase price of the property. So these two cases were consolidated, and the court had to rule whether or not there was a valid pacto de retro sale between the parties, and whether or not Ramos still had the right to repurchase the property. Oh, and whether or not Ramos still had the right to repurchase the property. 
So in this case, guys, uh, to resolve the controversy between the parties, the court had to examine the Pacto de Retro sale. And they had to uh, also establish whether or not it was indeed a sale or whether there was just an equitable mortgage between the parties. So the court here defined Pacto de Retro, wherein ownership of the property is immediately transferred to the vendi a retro, subject only to the repurchase by the vendor a retro within the stipulated period. So the ownership here of the buyer is actually subject to a resolutory condition. And that resolutory condition is the repurchase of the property. So failure by the vendor a retro to exercise the right of repurchase within the agreed time vest upon the vendi a retro by operation of law, absolute title to the property. So mura shag conditional sale. But in a conditional sale, the condition is suspensive, not resolutory. So the title of the vendi a retro upon failure to repurchase the property within the given time uh, is not impaired even if the Vendi a retro will not consolidate title under Article 1607 of the uh, Civil Code. Okay. On the other hand, in an equitable mortgage, guys, uh, in this kind of situation, the court has given us uh, essential requisites to establish the agreement between the parties as one of equitable mortgage instead of a sale. So first, the parties would appear to have entered into a contract of sale, but their intention was actually to secure an existing debt by way of mortgage. So these two requisites will help us identify whether there was indeed a valid sale or just a mortgage between the parties. Because in an equitable mortgage, when there is non-payment of the debt, then it will give the mortgagee the right, the right to foreclose on the mortgage, sell the property, and apply the proceeds of the sale to the satisfaction of the debt. However, guys, uh, uh, case law teaches us that this pacto de retro sale, it's actually a vehicle to uh, avoid detection that the parties are actually engaging into a pactum commissorium contract. Because if you take a look at the agreement here, kung uh, kung mo fail kag exercise sa pacto de retro, within the agreed upon period, then automatically by operation of law, the Vendi Aretro will acquire ownership over the property. So the court here uh, applied Article 1602 to further examine the Pacto de Retro sale on whether or not it was merely an equitable mortgage. So they did this, guys, because as already as I've already said, a contract purporting to be a pacto de retro is construed as an equitable mortgage when the terms of the document and the surrounding circumstances so require. Because the law actually discourages the use of pacto de retro because this, this scheme is frequently used to circumvent a contract known as pactum commissorium. This court has frequently noted that a pacto de retro is used to conceal a contract of loan secured by mortgage. So such uh, policy of the court na i-examine yun nila uh, in depth ang kanimang pacto de retro contract is because the law favors the least transmission of rights. Because imagine a situation guys na nangutang ka and you had to put up your property as security. So you're not uh, really uh, trying to dispose of your property but bad luck befell you 
you were not able to pay your debt and the in a pacto direct if you entered into a pacto direct for sale disguised as such to evade the pactum commissorium na prohibition then the debtor here or the seller is not really uh, getting the full price for the property alkan si kayo si seller ani si seller debtor ani ay kung imo giprinda ang imo hang yuta uh, you want to uh, get it back by paying your debt so it's usually the price the money involved there is usually fixed at a lesser price you're not get, getting the full value for your property so uh, the law discourages pacto de retro contracts because it will uh, it's usually used to circumvent pactum commissorium contracts and the court noted in this case that there were several circumstances to show that there was merely an equitable mortgage, foremost of which is the fact that the vendor retained possession of the property. Okay. Because if you're a creditor, guys, kung nagpautang ka and you required uh, security for that uh, loan that you extended, in case of non-payment of the loan amount, uh, you're not supposed to automatically appropriate the property. It needs to undergo foreclosure proceedings, either judicial foreclosure or extrajudicial foreclosure. So uh, public policy prohibits such automatic appropriation by the creditor of the property pledge or mortgage by the debtor. Okay. If you, uh, in a foreclosure proceeding wherein in I public sale or I private na auction of the uh, property's pledge or mortgage, okay, the owner of that property may yet, uh, may yet, uh, may yet receive a higher a price higher than what was the amount loaned. So, pwede ang sobra hatag niya. Instead, na uh, and the debtor can still get full value for the property. Kung na ay foreclosure proceedings. If none, then th that's not fair to the debtor or property owner. Okay, so in a pacto de retro, ownership is transferred upon delivery, but it's subject to a resolutory condition. In equitable mortgage, there is an ostensible sale, but the intent is only to secure a debt by way of mortgage or pledge, not, uh, not to transfer ownership of the property pledge or mortgage. Well, in a pactum commissorium, a pledge or mortgage agreement has a stipulation of automatic appropriation upon non-payment of the uh, debt. So that's a prohibited contract okay in the 2016 bar this was asked so you had to uh, you have in order to answer this question you have to determine whether there was a valid sale between the parties or whether there was simply an equitable mortgage so Akin ang facts to the Ramos versus Sarau case. Same here, ha? You are asked to uh, determine here whether there was a valid sale or merely equitable mortgage. Okay, and the last distinction that we must make is that between a sale and an assignment of credit. So... Assignment of credit is discussed in Article 1624 to 1635 of the Civil Code. And I assigned the case for this, uh, Law versus KGS Eco Formwork System. So what's the difference between assignment of credit and sale? 
So parties in an assignment of credit is the assignor and assignee. However, uh, there is a third person, not party to the assignment, but he is important and that person is the debtor. Okay, so the debtor in this situation is actually actually has uh, credit in his favor, but he is indebted to a creditor. And as a result of that uh, debt to the creditor, then whatever credits he has uh, will be assigned to the creditor to satisfy his existing debt. So the assigner here will be the one who, cons who constituted the credit. And the assignee will be the creditor of the debtor. I hope so. So in an assignment of credit, guys, uh, this is also a consensual contract. Consensual siya between the assignor and assignee. But typically, the consent of the debtor is not required for the assignment to proceed. Okay, utangan good siya. So in order to satisfy his obligation, then his credits must be assigned to the creditor. And uh, the subject matter in an assignment of credit are, of course, only intangible properties. Okay, while in a sale, there can be tangible or intangible, but exclusively in an assignment of credit, intangible properties are good. Nisha. And you already know what intangible properties are. So these are shares of stock, rights, interest, credits, and mga payables, etc. In an assignment of credit, the transfer of ownership happens upon execution of a public instrument. Okay, and uh, upon execution, there is placing of the titles in the possession of the assignee for the use of the rights. Okay, and we already know that uh, that's different from a contract of sale, wherein transfer of ownership happens at delivery. Okay, and assignment can be both onerous or gratuitous. But in a sale, it can only be onerous. So in this case, guys, uh, the court characterized assignment of credit as being in the nature of a sale of personal property. And it can produce the effect of the shun in payment or extinguishment of an obligation or a special mode of payment. And considering that assignment of credit is in the nature of a sale, then uh, in, an, in the law on sales, the vendor is bound by warranties. So in the same vein, the assignor will be bound by certain warranties. So that warranty will be that uh, uh, the assignor here in good faith must warrant uh, and be responsible for the existence and legality of the credit at the time of the assignment. Right? So if it turns out that the credit being assigned is not uh, legal or, or was inexistent or, or is not enforceable, then uh, the assignor here is not relieved from his debt. So the debt subsists, okay? So that concludes our discussion on chapter one. I will upload a third video to continue the discussion on chapter two, right? So see you guys in the next video.